Colin has been a long time observer of issues around economic development, uh, the Labour Party, uh, democracy under capitalism, um, and uh, recently uh, healthcare issues and the commercialization of public services and healthcare, uh, also in public broadcasting, uh, has done a terrific book on marketization of uh, healthcare. A book that's really worth seeing. Uh, is the co-editor of Socialist Register, and in the last issue had uh, an article on healthcare and capitalism, uh, which everybody should read. It's a really terrific piece. It has also written books on uh, development in Africa. I don't know if I forgot anything else you'd like me to particularly mention, Colin. Uh, Colin is, in, in some ways, a mentor on how to think and write clearly. Um, uh, very impressive skills. I was asked to talk about the lessons from uh, the British experience, whether they are lessons for Canadians or more restricted lessons that we have to learn that are special to us in England. Uh, I was going to have to worry about, but Natalie has sensibly proposed that I kick off and then she can decide to comment on what she thinks is relevant and what may not be. Okay, here is a picture of the health service as we had it at its peak. After it was founded in 1948, and there's how it was 30 years on. Um, the main thing to draw your attention to is the fact that the hospital clinical staff and the community health working staff are all salaried, and that remains the case. We do not have fee for service, and this makes a distinctive difference when you're talking organization. Um, and the other thing to draw your attention to is that on the government's own calculations at that time, the administrative costs of the health service were less than 6% of the total budget. Okay. Between 1980 and 2000, uh, which are primarily the years of Mrs. Thatcher's government and then her successor, John Major, and the, last, the first three years, 97 to 2000, of the new Labour government, the National Health Service began to be pushed in the direction of the market. The first step was to transfer hospital management into the hands of non-clinical managers. The second step was in the 90s to create the so-called internal market through the purchaser-provider split. The funding continues to come from tax revenues, but it's dispensed by local branches of the Department of Health the purchasers, who are nowadays called the commissioners, they commission health from hospitals and from family doctors, and they make the contracts with them. The hospitals in this situation become quasi-businesses, proto-businesses, and were renamed as trusts. And meeting financial targets begins to take precedence over the meeting of healthcare needs. <coughs> then in 2000, the government introduced the NHS plan, and this clearly foreshadowed a step beyond an internal to an external market. Hospitals no longer were paid in bulk contracts with the commissioners, three years lump of money based on historic performance, but were now to be paid, this was introduced gradually from 2003 onwards, on the basis of individual treatments, so-called Finnish consultant episodes. I should say, if I use the word consultant by mistake during this discussion, in England, all specialist doctors are known as consultants when they reach a certain level of, of uh, seniority. I'm not talking about management consultants. I'm talking about our specialist hospital physicians and surgeons. And all NHS hospitals were to be, over a period of time, converted into so-called foundation trusts, a term borrowed from Spain on a casual visit by the health minister to Madrid. He came back with this idea, the conservative health minister. And as foundation trusts, they're no longer accountable to the Department of Health, but only to a market regulator known as Monitor. You needn't bother with that. OK, this, the next three slides deal with the three levels of care and how they were privatized. Secondary care began by having 32 for-profit specialist treatment centers set up which would handle NHS patients. Following on that, this was widened into 
a thing called the Extended Choice Network, which now comprises 150 private hospitals or clinics, which are authorized to do any work for NHS patients if they get the contracts to do it. So they can bid with the commissioners against NHS hospitals or clinics to do that work. And the result is that although the total amount of surgery, for example, done by the private sector on NHS patients is probably considerably less than 10% of the total, that at the margin is a very significant loss of income to individual hospitals that happen to be near one of these centers or begin to lose a significant stream of patients because they're now paid by results, they're paid, paid by treatments. And so this destabilizes the finances of those hospitals and they start to act more and more like frightened businesses and they start to look for ways of cutting costs and the obvious way to cut costs in a thing which is as intensive, skilled labor intensive as medical care is to cut the skill mix to start finding cheaper for, uh, labor for, to replace more expensive labor, to replace doctors with nurses, nurses with nurse assistants, nurse assistants with trainee nurse assistants, and so on. At the level of primary and community care, primary care is your family doctor, community care in Britain is the term for all the ongoing treatment services for postnatal care, speech therapy, uh, health visitors uh, and, uh, for the elderly, infirm at home, and so on. Um, this went on ahead in two steps. First of all, nowadays, family doctors have to bid usually every five years for the contract with the purchaser or commissioner to continue their, their practice, to have their office, typically a, an office with five or seven doctors in it. They have to start bidding to have their contract renewed, and they will find themselves now bidding increasingly against United Health or Aetna or some large American HMO with offices in Britain bidding to take over these, these uh, contracts. And community care workers have been told that in the future they were going to have to also bid for their work by forming themselves into non-profit so-called social enterprises. And one can easily see what's going to happen in both these cases. They're bidding against corporations with very deep pockets, large bidding organizations, teams of lawyers, the capacity to lose money on bids until they have got enough. Uh, so this, these smaller groups are going to find themselves at a progressive disadvantage. And that is, of course, the intention that the big guys, which can, in theory, force costs down through economies of scale. That's not how it works, but that's the theory. They will, in fact, become major players in the provision of primary and community care. Then Lord Darcy, Lord Darcy, as we'll see in a moment, was an eminent uh, surgeon specializing in uh, robotic surgery who the government turned into a lord. It's not too difficult to do. You just spell the word. And he became Lord Darcy. And as Lord Darcy, he was a member of the upper house, and therefore he could become a minister. And they made him a junior health minister and asked him to do a review of the NHS. And his proposal included the proposal that two-thirds of hospital outpatient work, that's the word for non-inpatient non work, clinics and so on, could be moved out of hospitals and the expression was closer to the community and that all family doctors should progressively be absorbed into these centers or polyclinics which in reality would be built and managed by the private sector because the government did not propose, did not fund this, this operation. This was the proposal. The real goal behind this is best understood as an English version of the biggest healthcare, health management organization, health maintenance organization in the United States, California-based Kaiser Permanente, which is a non-profit but very ruthless big American HMO. And that has been the model that has been used within the Department of Health since 2000, constant references to the Kaiser model. And what they're looking for, and this one knows by reading the literature of the private sector, the, the journal called Health Investor, and another one called, um, um, well, it's the Health Services Journal, uh, and so on. There are several of them. And if you look at them, you see what the government's real plans are because they report the discussions that the Department of Health has been, has been having with the private sector 
And what they have in mind is that the current commissioners, of which there are 149 at present in England, should become something like health management organizations, using US insurance models, determining the payments made to providers, i.e. to doctors and hospitals, and monitoring and limiting the treatments uh, in the way we're all familiar, all Canadians are familiar with by seeing what's happening across the border. Specialists and family doctors will be expected to form themselves into clinical networks or what they sometimes call doctors' chambers on the lines of lawyers' chambers in Britain, that's to say groups of doctors with an, an office and an administrator who makes deals on behalf of the doctors to put in so many hours with that hospital, so many hours with this clinic and so on. Uh, selling their services to the highest <coughs> bidder in the private or the public sector. And as for citizens, they will receive a basic government contribution to, towards the covering of their health care, but then will choose among commissioners, just as Americans choose between HMOs if they have access to them, which were offering competing health plans. And these will include, of course, a wide range of co-payment options. In other words, you'll have roughly what happens in the United States to Medicare patients, to people over the age of 65, who are broadly funded by the tax revenues, but have a contribution to make individually as well, and then co-payments depending on what kind of icing on the cake they, they think they want. So that, I think, is the model that's planned. And here, the obvious consequences. The administrative costs have tripled, at least tripled, Inequality has returned because the level of provision is beginning to vary and will vary much more with inversely with the need for it. Co-payments have begun to be accepted, although it's completely contrary to the founding statements of the National Health Service and undoubtedly will be extended. And I noticed on a radio discussion just before I came over uh, somebody quizzing a member of the new government about it and it was interested to hear the interviewers say, so we'll all have to pay co-payments, right? We'll, we'll have to pay more towards the cost of care, as if that was the most na natural thing in the world. And I thought that was very interesting because the word co-payments is not current in British discussions of health care. She has picked that up. She was a woman and she picked it up from somewhere for people who are doing their homework and know this is the model that is actually being generated within the Department of Health. And now, of course, in the onset of the financial crisis, cutbacks to the National Health Service are now being projected as to be very severe, very substantial, very substantial. Something of the order of between 5 and 10 percent, at least, of the budget. And this is being justified in terms of, well, we must do it because we've got a crisis and we're going to be like the Greeks and we've got to get the uh, budget deficit down. And as soon as that happens, as soon as we go back to what happened in the 1970s when Mrs. Thatcher came to power, sorry, in the 90, early 1980s, after Mrs. Thatcher came to power in 79, she, she uh, froze the NHS budget for about five years. And that meant in real terms there was an annual cut of about 3% of the NHS. And by 1978, it was beginning to crack. It really couldn't cope. Waiting lists were enormous demoralization was extensive and so on. And that exactly coincides with the dramatic rise in private health insurance in Britain. Okay? So one will see that we're going to go back to that. It will be a recovery. Private health insurance has declined because the government increased spending on health care at the same time as it was privatizing it, marketizing it, as I've described. And it's been declining slightly, basically plateaued, but slightly declining in those years. But it's absolutely safe bet that it's going to go back up again. And I would summarize this story by saying it took 50 years to win the National Health Service, and it will take 50 years to destroy it. Between 1948, there was the struggle to get comprehensive universal health care. From 48 to 80, it was being built. From 80, 1980 to 2010, they've been fragmenting and marketizing it. And now, with the Conservatives in power again, in the context of a crisis with this extraordinary sort of masochistic agreement that everybody says, yes, we must cut the deficit, we must cut. Uh, it will only take them, I should think, at most 20 years to complete the process of restoring the situation that existed before World War II, when there was limited national insurance covering men <coughs> in work 
limited national insurance and otherwise a private healthcare market with some municipal hospitals offering very basic uh, free healthcare. That's what I think we will be getting back to. So as for the lessons we've learned, well, the first lesson is maybe not one that will go down well with some of you here because you're clearly all, uh, many of you are very experienced uh, mobilizers and organizers. I think that mass mobilizations are hugely important, but primarily as instruments of reminding people and educating people into the rights that they have and that are being eroded and taken away. I think only exceptionally is it an effective weapon to influence public policy in present circumstances. This is a picture of the protest that I was in in April this year against the closure of the emergency and maternity services in a big North London hospital, the one that I have had to go to a few times. Uh, and we had between four and 5,000 people, it turned out, at very short notice uh, to protest it. And because it was in the run-up to an election, it did scare the Labour government, which was fighting for its life, into announcing a stop on all hospital closures. But we all knew that this was an election reaction. It did have that effect. And it produced one very gratifying result, which was the resignation of this top NHS civil servant who was happily planning the closure of all these hospitals and the creation of the private clinics. And he resigned in disgust of the government's failure to support the, the program at that moment. But then I thought about this demonstration in February 2003, when not 4,000, but 2 million people were on the streets of London, and it didn't stop the Iraq war. I think demonstrations are very important, but one shouldn't mistake them as weapons of in policy influence other than rather special circumstances. I think they're hugely important as mobilization and educational things. So what are the lessons we've learned? This has been done by a small group of individuals. It's a remarkable story. Fundamentally, it's been a conspiracy. The government did not need, need primary legislation to make these changes. It claims, and for all I know it's right, but it's a little hard to see, that it has sufficient authority, legislative authority to do all this by legal instruments. That the, the law allows the kind of reformulations it's pushed through, most of them, without a parliamentary uh, legislation, legislation going through parliament. As a result, it's mostly gone ahead with a series of announcements of accomplished facts, rather than debates on the, in the House of Commons about the principles at stake and where it would go. It's quite remarkable. At the same time, you have to remember that this is the Labour Party in office that has pushed it through. So it took a rebel Labour MP to challenge it, or a Conservative MP who was rather unusual, because most Conservative MPs have been only too happy to see Labour do this. Uh, and there have been the odd Conservative voice from Parliament for raising questions more or less because, well, it's the job of opposition to oppose, but it's been basically nobody there in the House of Commons, or very few people, who both informed and committed and willing to pay the price with the party leadership of attacking these policies. So the Department of Health has effectively been captured. To push this through, this program through, in 2003, the government created a commercial directorate within the Department of Health. By June 2006, it had 190 officials in this, inside this directorate within the department. Of these, 182 were recruited directly from the private sector on short-term contracts. There were only eight civil servants in this, in this operation. In effect, in other words, the strategic drive of the Department of Health had been outsourced to the private sector, which was the main, going to be the main beneficiary of it. The privatizers can't win the argument, but they can win the outcome by penetrating the state. And that was the sort of acme of that process. But although the commercial directorate has since been closed, its functions have been transfer transferred out of the Department of Health into the commissioning arms uh, of the, the purchasing part of the Department of Health, who are pursuing the policy of commissioning from the private sector wherever they can in order to create competition for uh, 
uh, and subsequently displace much of the publicly owned hospitals and publicly operated sectors. So the, the scene of action is not in the street outside of Whittington Hospital for the most part. It is here in the Department of Health in Whitehall. And here is my rogues gallery of some of the people uh, involved. Dr. Penny Dash, English trained doctor, went to the United States, went to California on a scholarship, got a job with Kaiser Permanente, then moved to Boston Consulting, came back and was appointed director of strategy in our Department of Health. She was there for three years and then she moved on and became the top person in McKinsey in their health wing. Chris Hamm, director of strategy in the Department of Health who succeeded her, professor of public health at Birmingham, person here from doing public health this morning, I was, yeah, okay. Uh, PIM Director of Strategy, very instrumental over pushing the Kaiser model for the National Health Service, and is now the director of the King's Fund. The King's Fund is the largest, by far the largest, health policy think tank, heavily corporate funded, closely working now with corporations, on, uh, claims it's independent, uh, read that how you like. Uh, Patricia Hewitt, Secretary of State for Health, that means she was the top health minister, that's the term for our top minister of health. She was Secretary of State for Health uh, for, two, for three years. She resigned and became a special consultant to Alliance Boots, which is the biggest pharmaceutical retailer, to some extent wholesaler in Britain, and on the private equity fund Sinven, which is a heavy, um, it's a private equity investor in buys and sells health facilities, mainly uh, in Britain, but also elsewhere. Um, this is the, the revolving door phenomenon, right? These are top people in the Ministry of Health who go out. And here's another picture of her, <laughs> taken about um, two months ago, when she was caught in a sting together with Jeff Hoon, former Defence Secretary. <laughs> They were told that uh, if they came to a certain office, they could uh, might get some interesting work with a new American consultancy. And they were secretly videoed saying, posting about what they could offer. And she was asked how much she would charge, and she said about 5,000 a day. Pounds, that's not dollars, a day. That was her, her fee. Lord Warner, who was a junior minister, overlapped with her, uh, junior minister of health. He quit and he became a strategic advisor to Deloitte, which is a big management consultancy and accountancy with heavy health in health. In other words, these people are not being hired for their nice faces or their academic training, but for their inside knowledge of the health ministry of their department of health. Mark Britnell, he's a good example of a public of a civil servant <coughs> who was absolutely at the center of the privatization drive between 2000 and three, right through to 2009, when he finished up as the Director General of the process. And then he went on gardening leave, and within three months, he was uh, head of health of the KPMG, which is the one big uh, management consultancy with a very big stake in health policy. I interviewed them once, and their spokeswoman told me that the Department of Health was the crown jewel in their health portfolio. In other words, the business they got from the Department of Health. And here is Lord Dazzy, a surgeon, made a junior health minister and a lord in 2007. And he's the one who recommended moving care out of hospitals. And I put him in not because I have anything against him personally, except that I think uh, he let himself be used. Because this is a device that the government will, any government will use if it can. It will find a compliant, sympathetic, figure with some status in the medical field and use it to front or her to front their uh, activities, which was to some extent the same with Penny Dash. And he did it for two years and then whether he realized he'd been used or just got sick of the company he was keeping, I don't know, he resigned. So here are the lessons that I draw from this experience. First of all, Britain suffered from the fact that we had already a substantial private sector which Canada doesn't have. Uh, I think it's, it's so important to resist all for-profit provision, to resist it absolutely, bitterly, make it as hard as possible for that to be pushed through, boycott it, publish all its scandals, make it, make it uh, isolated <coughs> in any way possible, uh, do that. Because if you don't, it's, it's a bridgehead. 
Secondly, and this is something I've only really come to think about clearly quite recently, one has to know what's happening inside the ministry. One has to find out who is seeing who, who is dining with <coughs> who, who is attending what conferences, who is giving, who is traveling overseas. You think that's impossible to find out? If you ask your teenage son, who's really good on Twitter and all the rest of it, they can find out. And if they don't do it that way, you get them to read the Health Service Journal and the uh, Health Investor uh, and uh, Lang and Wisson's Health Market News. The, the house journals of the private sector describe these meetings and conferences and dinner parties. Uh, it, it's out there. And what one has to do is realize that that's where the action is and expose it. These people do not want it to be known. And the reason they don't want it to be known is that they couldn't get it by in Parliament. They couldn't get it by in public. But if they're allowed to do it quietly for enough time, you'll fi you'll fi you finish up with an accomplished fact. <coughs> Thirdly, research the links between the media people and corporate interests. I mean, I would like to know, for example, I mentioned this this morning, I won't say it again, what David Gratzer's uh, connections are. He's a physician and author, and he's peddling the lie that, that uh, contracting out surgery in Britain uh, led to save money and increased capacity. Uh, I'd be very interested to know what his connections are in the medical field, in the pharmaceutical field, and so on. These things ought to be known. When anybody from the left uh, goes on a television program or a radio program in Britain, they're always introduced as the editor of some funny thing, like the Socialist Register, you know, well-known Marxist, Neo Panic, or whatever. But when it's Dr. Grazer, he's just Dr. Gratzer, right? But one wants to say Dr. Gratzer, or in to take, take the case of uh, Penny Dash, Dr. Penny Dash, right, member of Doctors for Reform, well-known right-wing organization, chair, deputy chair of the King's Fund, corporate-funded King's Fund. I mean, that information should be there, and we should always use it. We should never give these people's names without their corporate and other affiliations. We should know, people should know that, that these are not innocent remarks. Uh, and this is true for reporters and colonists and including academics. And finally, the need for a good media strategy. This must go alongside mobilizational work. The two feed each other. It's really important not to allow big money to have all the good tunes, all the access to, to, to the airtime.